<laughs> we're just gonna do it. All right, welcome to the Education Collective. This is your girl, the Pivot Strategist. It's what I like to call myself, but hey, you know, formally, my name is Olivia, but you can refer to me as the Pivot Strategist. And so I'm very nervous, but guess what? We're going to do it together. And so the Education Collective, I wanted to make sure that I subscribed and provided a place and a safe space for everyone inside of the education sector. If you're curious about education or if you just, you know, have thoughts about education, I wanted to create a space where we can just belong, right? Where we can just feel like, hey, we can say what we need to say and let that be that. And so starting out as our first episode, wow, <laughs> I just said it, our first episode on the Education Collective, I want to play this clip. And this clip has pretty much been going viral <laughs> again, all over TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and I really want to know your thoughts. So let's get to the clip. I'm only going to play just a few seconds of the clip and then we're going to go into a deep dive. All right. So your son's in seventh grade. Yeah. What grade level does he read at? Right now it's second grade. What grade level does he do math at? I believe that's first or second grade. What do you think about that? I'm horrified. We also spoke with this father, Gregory Gray. My son is really in de desperate need of, of tutoring in math. And how did my son pass if he didn't know none of this math? Not wow. Wow. So this is just a smaller clip of a larger video. But, you know, within those first 25 seconds, a lot really stood out to me. Here we have a scholar that is in the seventh grade reading at a second grade reading level, right? And to the average person, you'd say, wow, that's insane. Like, how did that even happen? How did this kid actually get to the seventh grade, right? You may have some other people saying, well, I blame COVID. Even though COVID came about almost three years ago, but hey, <laughs> you know, some may say, well, parents are just overworked and they're tired. Like you, you just, there's nothing you can do, right? Now, my perspective, of course, I am an educator. I'm also a parent, right? But I'm also someone who likes to do deep dives on the why behind something, right? The how, the why, we know what the what is. The what is the decline in foundational skills and foundational knowledge, right? So we know what the what is. How did this kid get here? Or we have the, the father, the father who says, hey, you know, I, I've wanted my kid to have tutoring, right? I've fought for this. I, I've wanted this. And I'm trying to figure out why their school hasn't given it to me. Here's the thing. And this is why I love our little deep dives, because I feel like we can look at this surface level or we can get down to the nitty gritty. Right. But the way that I tell my stories here, I like to kind of peel the onion a little bit, but I also like to talk from experience. I just don't like the idea of talking about an issue if you have never had to deal with it face on or you've never had any personal experience with it. So 
I've been in the educational sector for over six, seven years, right? And I taught for five of those years in the classroom. And so starting out my career as an educator, I, I think it's always funny because, you know, a lot of people are like, well, did you go to school for education? The answer is no. <laughs> I did not think that, you know, I wanted to be a teacher. You know, I actually went to school and majored in sociology, minored in criminology. I actually interned at the Juvenile Justice Center. But that is where I started to see part of the problem, right? What I saw in the Juvenile Justice Center was very alarming to me. I saw a lot of scared children going through the system with no plan, right? And when they would invite someone, a representative from the school, when they would invite them to come and speak at their hearings, it would not be much that they would say <laughs> at the hearings. And I thought to myself, why? Like, why is that? Because I value my education, you know, and, and I think that the reason why I value it so much is because I felt like it was almost taken away from me, you know, partly <laughs> because of my own actions, but also because of a system that says that if you're not able to conform to what we need by the time that we need it, you will be a part of the forgotten ones. Getting my start in criminal justice really, it really sparked an interest for me in children and just how, the how and the why, right? So I'm a very solution-driven like person. And so I like to get down to the nitty gritty of well, how and why did this happen? And just thinking back after I left that internship, after I graduated, you guessed it. <laughs> I had to do a long pause. I ended up working for the Department of Family and Children's Services. Don't ask me why I started working there because I really don't know why. I just think it was just an opportunity, right? However, looking back, I can see how they all connect together that led me to the classroom. And so my time there, I learned a lot, again, about, you know, kids who were considered the air quotes, forgotten ones, right? And after my short time there, I said, wow, like, I don't know where I want to end up next. And so I saw this advertised program called Teach for America. And I thought, wow, that would be really crazy if I became a teacher. Like, I like kids, you know, and, and I feel like I love to talk <laughs> so I can do it. Y'all, I'm giving y'all the inside to my mind at the time. And although that is just not enough, if you are going to stand in front of kids and empower, teach, and encourage kids, it's not enough to just say you like kids. I love kids, but it's not enough to step in front of a classroom and, you know, be responsible for them learning information that they need to make it into the real world. And so... I remember joining the program and I also remember going on my interviews <laughs> that I went on, very scared, very nervous. You know, with every new opportunity, there comes like this, this moment of, you know, am I enough? You know, the imposter syndrome kind of kicks in, right? And so I got an amazing opportunity to work for a school district that I, you know, think is a very great school district. Now, the school that I was chosen to work in, it was a school where I would say that I am really thankful for working in this school because I was allowed to see what the real problem is in education and working in communities that are under-resourced, underserved. So I, I got to see what it was like firsthand, right? And so for me, I, you know, just remember being very nervous inside of the interview process. You know, it was a paneled interview and they're like, okay, you know, we like you. We like this, you know, this girl. We feel like she definitely has a heart for kids, like she has a fire for kids. But let's see if we can kind of bring her through the ringer to show her what the day in the life of working in what we would call the South Side of Atlanta, Georgia, what those schools are like. Let's see if she can handle it, right? So. 
honestly speaking in the interview process, I felt like I was being punked. I was like, why are these panelists, why are they acting crazy in the middle of the interview? I guess for a second, I didn't realize that, oh, they're acting like what I would see in the classroom. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. And so that should have been a red flag right there for me, you know, just backing up and saying, okay, you know what? I, I, th- I think I'm good on this, but it wasn't. And so I handled it with grace so much so that they offered me the job at the end of the interview and I took it and I was so excited to embark on this journey. So excited because I just felt like, okay, here is where I belong, Right. And fast forward to getting my assignment, what grade I was going to be teaching, I was going to be teaching fourth grade. Now, I had always envisioned myself teaching lower elementary grades because I always thought, well, it, it'll be easy, right? Like little five and six year olds, they can't be hard, you know, to please. But I ended up with nine and 10 year olds. And I just remember just being very young. First year teacher starting out, remember the days of feeling so lost. Like I just could not do it, right? And part of the reason why is when I actually started to look at the demographics of the kids that were in my classroom, I thought to myself, this is impossible. There's no way. When I looked at my demographics of my classroom, I saw that I was assigned 33 kids, (laughs) which I was like, where are they all going to sit at? But okay, you know, 33 kids. And I would say 85% of the 33 were what we would call listed as kids who needed severe intervention, kids who had individualized educational plans, what we would call IEPs in the special education program. And so I thought to myself, okay, well, obviously there is going to be some support in the classroom because I'm not understanding what I have going on right now. (laughs) But for me, I'm always one to never give up. And so I said, okay, you know, like, let me see what I can do. And so meeting my kids, you know, building relationships with kids have never been an issue for me. I think as an educator, you go into the classroom and you just be yourself. Because if you're not yourself around kids, they will sniff you out. They're like, oh, mm -mm, she is not it. Like we're not rolling with her. And they will let all of their friends know and you will just be doomed. (laughs) Kids know when you're faking it. So I just knew I had to be myself. I am very you know, I laugh at my own jokes, you know, clumsy, you know, I'm tripping over things. I'm, you know, losing my phone 25 times a day. Like I just did not want to hide that part of myself for my kids. And so I think that early on me and my kids hit it off, but there was something that was very alarming to me that really brought me to tears. Remember back to the demographics that, you know, I talked about earlier was that 85% of my class was you know, in the range of severe intervention. So what we would call RTI, response to intervention, tier two, tier three, right? So these are kids who need severe intervention all the way up to kids who were in special education, right? Who had IEPs and who were supposed to receive services, right? And so with knowing that when we started to do the beginning of the school year assessments, Once I got that data back, I feel like I almost fell to the floor because I said, okay, I thought it was impossible before, but I know for sure (laughs) it's not going to happen this year because, you know, as a teacher, your goal was to at least you know, 80% of your class needed to move at least one grade level ahead, right? When I got my data, that 85% of my classroom were at least two to three grade levels behind. If I taught fourth grade, we're talking about kindergarten, first grade level students in the fourth grade. I'm going to say it again. (laughs) Fourth grade students 
averaging at a kindergarten first grade level reading ability. I forgot to mention I was a reading teacher, but we're new here and we're we're just going to roll with it. And so with knowing that, and I even had some students who were performing below kindergarten and we know what's right before kindergarten. I don't think we have to say it, right? And I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? I was at the point where I couldn't walk away because I knew that if I didn't try to fix it, I don't think anybody would. So I started to go to my colleagues like, hey, did you know that students are (laughs) severely behind? And the overall consensus was, oh, yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, they're behind. Yeah, severely behind. And I'm like, okay, it's, uh, you know, is anyone, is anyone gonna, you know, help a sister out? <laughs> like, is anybody gonna help me? And of course, everyone was looking at me like, good luck. I even had some of my colleagues say, good luck, because I had that group last year. Good luck. I had that group two years ago. Good luck. Oh, I had that group when they first came into the school. My thought process then was, well, if you had them, then obviously you didn't teach them anything, right? (laughs) Like, but I knew that I was new, so I just couldn't say much. So I just kept my mouth closed because I just didn't know what to say. But again, going back to the solution-driven person that I am, I said, wow, we've got to come up with a plan because this cannot be their reality when they leave here. When they leave the fourth grade, this cannot be their reality. And so I would sit in meetings where the 85% of my class were never mentioned when we're sitting in data meetings. The 85% were never mentioned, but the 15%, oh no, that's all we talked about were the 15%, you know, of my class that were on grade level or above. Those are the only ones we talked about. And I started to raise questions as to why that was a thing. And what really triggered me, and it still triggers me now, is that when I raised the question, because I just had enough. I'm like, okay, enough is enough. I'm tired of talking about the 15%. Like, I get it. I'm going to always make sure these kids have everything that they need. But as their teacher and as someone who is advocating for them because I had them eight, well, actually, at that point, nine hours of the day. It is my duty to make sure I advocate for the 85. Like we're focusing on the 15, but what about the 85? And so they told me to shut up. (laughs) You're asking too many questions. You care too much and to just move on. And that is when I knew that I didn't have any allies in the school when it came to making sure that these babies, my babies, because they became mine, that they walked out what we would describe as whole, right? That they didn't walk out of the fourth grade saying, well, guess it's going to be another year of me not knowing anything, me not learning anything. I didn't want it to be that reality for them. So I went home. I said, okay, what can I do? What I started to look at the dynamics of the school schedule, the dynamics of the classroom. What were some extra spaces and time that I had that I could change some things around, right? I knew that I could change what I was in control of. Well, at least what I thought I was in control of, right? Because you think you have control, but you really don't. And so I knew that asking parents to practice this, you know, with your kid, I knew that that was just going to be a battle. And I didn't think it was going to be an impossible battle, but I wanted to see what I can do in the realm of what I could control in the classroom. And so I sat down and I said, wow, I said, it looks like to me that I have like an extra 45 minutes in the morning time before the school day starts, right? And then I also have the tutoring program (laughs) after school hours that I can kind of use that as well. But I'll tell y'all about the tutoring program in, in just a minute because I pretty much did what I needed to do um, because the school wasn't going to do it, right? And so with that 45 minutes, I thought, wow, it would really be nice because 
85 percent of my class were supposed to receive intervention services through the rti process right and i said wow it would really be nice if i could get the interventionist to come into the classroom we split up my 85 percent based off of skills that they were severely behind in and these were foundational skills we're talking about blending sounds we're talking about these basic foundational skills that they should have mastered in kindergarten and first grade to get them to be better readers so that they can approach the fourth grade work. Because the thing is, I was being told that, hey, by law, you must introduce them to the fourth grade material. And I said, but that's not working because they're tearing up the room. And I would tear up the room too if you gave me something that was, imagine if, I was reading medical school terminology, you know, books or medical school books, right? It would be a foreign language for me because I don't know anything about it. So I would get frustrated and I would probably stop. So that is exactly what these kids done in the classroom. They're like, we don't know how to do this because by the fourth grade, you should already know how to read. The only thing we're focusing on are comprehension strategies. (laughs) Like, So, but how can you comprehend what you don't know? How can you comprehend what you don't know how to do? That's just like sending me out there to be a mechanic and I've never done anything that's mechanic related. I did not master it before, right? But this is what is going on in the schools today. And it is very sad. This is why we're at a national crisis of reading deficiencies. Like, yes, I think individually we can pull out these kids and say, oh my, like you're reading above grade level. But nationally, we are in a crisis. We are. And that is some real statistics for us all to bask in and know that at some point, we just got to be real with ourselves. And so anyway, I thought to call on the interventionist and I said, hey, I want to put up a plan if we go ahead and split them based off of skill so that they can get, you know, better within these skills so that we can get them to where they need to be. I knew that I was not going to get them on a fourth grade reading level in just one year's worth of time, right? I wasn't going to get them there. I knew that. That was not my goal. My goal was at least to help them grow one year. One year's worth of growth, right? And so the interventionist was like, you know, I see where you're going with this and I like it. And I said, all right, it's a go, it's game. So I thought. (laughs) I went to admin and they were like, nope, we're not supporting you with doing that. No, we're not doing that. Like, nope, find somebody else to do it. You know, and I was devastated. I actually cried when I got shut down because I knew what I was asking for. So what I was asking for was for me to have the interventionist in my room majority of the day so that we can tackle those skills early in the morning, tackle the skills during guided reading, right? We could tackle these skills because there's no point in putting kids together based off their reading levels because they may not all struggle with the same reading skill. So I think that that is something that schools really have to do a better job with because I think it's easier for them to just, oh, all of them in the green over here, that'll be one group. All of them in in the red over here, let's do two groups. It's easier for them to do that versus to really do a deep analysis and a deep dive on what skill is this child struggling with or almost on the cusp of understanding what skill is it these groups should be skill based and so um, because here you can have someone that is on grade level struggling with the same skill (laughs) that someone who is in the red one grade level below they're struggling with the same skill but they're not in the same group why Because you're putting all the reds together, putting all the greens together, putting all the yellows almost there together. That's how they're grouping the classrooms. And you wonder why some of our kids are just not getting it. Because they're placing them wrong. Anyway, going back to that, I went back to the interventionist, right? Went back to her and I said, hey, you know, they shut me down, but... 
why don't we just do it anyway? <laughs> I'm all about being a rebel when it makes sense. It, like, I, I'm all about not following the rules when it makes sense. If it's for a greater cause, then hey, by all means, let, let's go ahead and let's break the ice. <laughs> so we started to do it off the record. Yes, there are teachers in schools today that are doing things off the record. Why? Because the politics tells us that we can't do it. We have to do otherwise, right? And so once I started to see the data change, right? So instead of the data going down in a downward angle, we actually started to see some progress. Now, this was only about two months worth of progress, but then I felt like I had some leverage. So I'm like, yeah, I, I want them to tell me that I can't do it <laughs> in the classroom because I said, well, it's not going to be too much longer that we can do this off the books because they're going to come in, they're going to observe us and they're going to see that we're not doing what they told us to do. Right. So like, I'm all in the spirit of being a rebel. Like I'm all in the spirit of doing what I need to do to get what I need to get. Now I'm not saying go break any laws. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but what I'm saying is a part of advocacy is, you know, doing things and asking for permission later. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> like, especially if it's for a greater good. Okay. They didn't understand the vision at first, but let me tell you something. After I went to them, the second time. And I said, Hey, you know, see, I got a little smart on them because see, they love to tell you, Oh, well, wait, what does your data say? I need some data to back up what your decision is. You know, I'm like, okay, cool. Here's your data. You just want to slap this data on the desk and I'm going to let you know, like, look at what I've been doing off the record. <laughs> you know, please don't fire me today, but look at what I've been doing. And so I did. I went to admin and I said, hey, you know, this is what me and the interventionist, you know, have been doing in the classroom. And we have seen such a incline in these skills. And here is where we tested these skills, right? And so we did all type of assessments throughout just the progress monitoring and everything and so they looked at me like I was crazy and they said okay they said okay all right like we get it like you you really want to do this thing right and so we'll give you the interventionist we'll let her go in your room and she can pretty much stay the whole day <laughs> but guess what we're gonna do it under the name of well you don't really know how to handle your kids so you need someone in there to really you know help you manage those kids because you don't know what you're doing and I'm like you know what Y'all really are something, okay? But sometimes when you're advocating and sometimes when you know where you're going and you have got a path to get there, it's the little things like that to where I could have said, what are you talking about? Like, that does not make any sense. Like, are you like serious right now? Because we've been doing an entire plan that I created. And you mean to tell me I don't know how to manage the kids? Like, yes, the kids behavior was very challenging and what some would call off the chain. However, um, I understood the how and the why behind the behavior, right? Which is why I said, okay, we've got to get them practicing these skills so that they can actually stop this behavior. Because all it was was just a response to the trauma of them being in the classroom and not learning anything. That's all it was, right? And so sometimes the reason why you must know the plan and you must know how you're going to get to the plan is because sometimes there are things, there are people, there are situations that are there to throw you off the course. And I don't know why I didn't say anything to them then, but I think I knew in the back of my mind, I actually have bigger fish to fry and I can't sit here and argue with you all telling me I don't have any classroom management. The reason why you're going to give me the intervention is I don't care. Like you, you just given me the intervention. You gave me what I asked for so that I can help move these kids. Right. And so sometimes, you know, that's just a part of the encouragement, right? When the plan is the plan, it does not matter who is trying to come in from the side of the tracks to say, Hey, you can do this or you don't, or you don't know how to do this. You do like the plan is the plan, right? The plan is the plan. So we continued to do what we were doing, right? Some days, I'm not going to lie, y'all. Some days I felt like I had kind of bit off more than I can chew, right? 
some days, sometimes I felt like I was alone <laughs> because like when you have a vision, not everybody can understand the vision, right? When you have a goal, not everyone can understand the goal. It would be some days where even the kids were like, I don't believe I'm going to get to the promised land. I don't believe I'm going to get there because I also told the kids like, this is what we're going to be able to do by the end of the school year. Y'all just got to stick with me. Trust me on this. We're going to get here, you know, and some days, some days were really long. Some days, you know, were really short. Going back to the tutorial program that was at the end of the school day. So the tutorial program was what I later found out (laughs) was a program that was meant for kids who were assumed to pass the state mandated testing that they have at the end of the school year in the state of Georgia, right? And so I just thought the tutorial program were for just, you know, kids who were recommended in the program, right? And so I was just thinking like, oh man, like this kid will benefit, this kid will benefit. Like, yeah, I'm definitely going to make sure I tell this kid's mom. And so when I got the list, I said, well, wait a minute, like why are some of the kids that I was thinking about, why are they not on the list? Because clearly they need help, right? And so that's when they said, well, these kids are pretty much on the cusp in the yellow, um, you know, into the green in the assessments, the beginning of the school year, middle of the school year assessments, right? And so because they're there, we need to get them into the green so that we know that they're going to pass this state assessment at the end of the school year. The kids who are already in the green, they're not worried about them. They just need to keep them there. They're not going to challenge them any further, but they're just going to keep them there because they know that they're going to pass. My jaw almost dropped to the floor because I said, well, (laughs) I get it. All kids need help. However, these kids severely need help. So if you give me this extra hour, we could really shake up some things, right? Wrong. So again, there was another instance where I was having to go off the books, right? (laughs) I'm like, you know what? I started coordinating with some of the parents and I said, hey, if you can be here at this time to come and pick up your kid, they can stay. But I need for you to promise me that you're going to be here so that this does not have to be a long drawn out thing. Right. And so I coordinated with the parents. Everything was going smoothly. I was met with opposition along the way from admin because they did not understand the vision. They couldn't understand why I wanted to help my 85 percent so much. They could not understand why I cared. And I didn't have time to explain to them why I cared. That just was not a part of the plan. So anyway, we stuck with the plan, right? Here comes the end of the school year. End of the school year comes. And I was really nervous to get those results from the end of the school year data. But let me tell you something. When we got those results, oh my gosh. (laughs) I saw kids who were in the red go to the high yellow Some of them actually went to the green. Well, what does that mean? Pivot strategies? I'll tell you what that means. We had kids go from kindergarten, pre-K, reading level to a second, third grade. And some even ended up in the green, fourth grade reading level. But I said all that to say that the 85%, not only did they grow one year's worth of growth, They actually grew two to three and even four years worth of growth. Wow. The thunder, the real thunder is coming in. That means that we were moving, right? Room 118 was moving. (laughs) And so when I got the piece of paper, I just put my head down because sometimes like when you have the vision, when you have the dream, when you have the plan. And it just seems like not everybody's on that same plan, vision, dreams, and goal, right? They're not on that same thing. And you fight. And I'm telling you, I fought with everything that I had in me. The interventionist fought with everything she had in her. She was a veteran teacher that had been teaching well over 20 years. And I knew she was tired. I was tired. And it was my first year teaching. (laughs) I was tired. So I knew she was tired. And I looked at those kids of 118. And I said, 
wow, y'all have done it. And when I tell you, I showed them their data and they were crying, they were screaming. They're like, oh my gosh, we did it. You know, and there were like some things along the way that we had to fight for, that we had to really move mountains for. But I told them, I said, y'all did it. And I was like, so you never let anybody tell you that it's impossible because y'all just proved that it is possible, right? And that was the highlight of my, it was one of the highlights because I had several moments like that throughout my teaching career, right? But that was the first highlight of my teaching career where I knew that that is where I belonged, right? But I also knew and found out about the struggles inside of the education system, right? Like I could not believe the adversity that I was facing from the system itself. The same system that is set up to help our kids, right? I just couldn't understand it. And so going back to understanding what the plan is, fighting for what you know is right, fighting for what you know will lead to the end goal of the plan. And so some of the things that I kind of questioned that school year, what was the issue, right? Like I knew all of the challenges that I faced. I found out that the system was just broken because I just could not understand how we let nine and 10 year olds get here without, it's it's almost like they didn't know anything. I just could not, I, I just, I, I couldn't understand it. And so I wanted to reflect on that year was just the idea of, well, who benefits from the public education sector? If I am a kid who, you know, is on grade level, I'm, you know, have really great behavior and I know what I'm doing, then of course I'm just going to skate through, right? But if I'm a kid who I'm really struggling, I may or may not have good or bad behavior, then what it, What about me? <laughs> like, what about me? Like, so who benefits? And we have school leaders, we have teachers, we have community leaders who are just sitting on the sidelines. Some are not sitting on the sidelines. Some are just ringing the bell. I know for me, like, they, of course, we'll do more deep dives, you know, on this very same thing. But I said all this to say that I understand how we have the seventh grader reading on the second grade reading level. I just walked y'all through how it happened my first year of teaching. How the parent wanted tutoring, but of course, tutoring was not going to be for his kid because his kid is not a benefit to the school. It's not going to help the school grade score, the school testing scores. If not, if it's not going to help, why in the world would the school help your kid? So those are like thoughts that run through my mind, right? And so with closing, because this has been like a deep conversation and I know I've kind of taken y'all into just my first year of teaching and I really want to open this space for more conversation on the how, the why, and the solution, right? So what do we do? Like when we know these issues are here, like what do we do? And it is not a one size fit all solution. I think that part of the solution is actually having the conversation. Some people don't even know that these things happen in schools. There are parents who drop their kids off at schools who have no idea what your kid is going through or even learning throughout the school day. So for me, to my fellow educators, I see you. I hear you. I am you. I'm with you, right? The fight is not fought alone. And this episode here is dedicated to Room 118, where I learned that advocacy is not just about speaking up and speaking out, but it's about action, right? What can I do with the problem? I can speak up about the problem. I can complain about the problem all day. But what am I going to do about the problem? And I think that's a lot of times educators, people who are working in schools or in the community, they're ti- they get tired. And that's a real thing. The burnout is real. And so as we kind of come to an end, 
this platform is is going to be a space of awareness. We're going to offer solutions. We're going to seek the solutions out because I'm not one that knows all the solutions. However, I know to create a space where we can find the solutions, right? And I just want to provide a place for educators, admin, communities, community leaders to just keep it real. (laughs) You know, we can keep it real here. This is a safe space. You know, I want to have real and raw conversations on this podcast, conversations where I felt as an educator, we kind of had to have these off the grid, right? We couldn't speak too loud because we didn't want anybody to hear us because the politics in education is real. And we're going to talk about it on this podcast. But I just want to reassure y'all that the fight is for the lost and forgotten ones, right? Because they also matter in education. So as we close, I just want y'all to remember that the plan is the plan, right? And to just really think about, well, who actually benefits from the education sector? Who benefits? Who benefits? You know? But... Until next week, I would love to say thank y'all for riding out this first episode with me. I would really love to know your thoughts. This podcast can be found everywhere on Apple, Spotify. So wherever you subscribe to, go ahead and make sure you look up the Education Collective. Until then, see you next time.